Okay, so I am here with my friend Wendy. Hey, and, Kelly. Um, <laughs> she just talked to us about uh, meeting protocols, which I asked her to talk about this because um, this is something I admittedly am don't know a ton about. And when I get these kids, I go, um, yeah. So this is, I thank you so much for doing this. Sure. Um, and so, uh, one of the things I, as Wendy mentioned, she's really, uh, Wendy is actually superhuman and, uh, <laughs> she works in 400 different places and knows everything about everything. So, um, I love that you, uh, I, I love that you are really able to take, you do such a nice job at bridging the gap sort of between, uh, school based and medical based. And, um, I think that's so nice that you're able to do that. And then you're able to kind of share that knowledge. Well, thanks. I really enjoy it. And I think the longer I've been a speech pathologist, the more I see those connections of like, um, how something like neonatal, neonatal feeding rhythms, then become what you see later for state regulation and i think that's a fascinating part of our field that there's so many connections in that oral motor realm between the speech and the feeding and you know if you have a a kindergartner who doesn't have their k's and g's and they then they also have a tongue thrust well gosh they've got big tonsils and what do you know right. they also have obstructive dysphagia and you kind of fold all those pieces of information together to come up with a stronger picture of what you need to do for the kid right and i think what you know certainly what i get hung up on is i you know you move outside your level of comfort so you know i maybe i notice those big tonsils and then i'm like but i think this might lead to this and then i sort of you know i go pouring through the file and hope to god that they've gone to see somebody <laughs> well yeah don't we all i right. mean that's like the worst case scenario to be like oh darn this is like the tip of the iceberg and yeah and i yeah. think that's why i wrapped up the, with the talk with that whole like here's the ideal but in reality you know our kids might be dealing with bigger issues within their home like incarcerated parents and right, food right, insecurity right, right. and so then when i come talking about something that seems survivable right. it's it's right. less of an issue even in the case of like kids that are um in the case of that high schooler you know for whatever reason, his parents didn't have a very long life expectancy for him. And so they aren't really as bothered maybe as, as someone who has seen what good management of dysphagia can give to an individual. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, what I really liked when you said, um, you know, eating at school is part of LRE, you know, this is part of, it's, it's part of least restrictive environment for these kiddos. And so really when you frame it in that way, like you, you have to take it on, even if it makes you a little bit nervous. I was filling in at a school just last week and they're doing their EI transitions or CSE <laughs> transitions. So bringing those, those preschoolers up on in and they had, um, you know, the, the preschooler, of course, that has the file that's already two inches thick and this right. kiddo is super involved and it had the school age team just a flutter. You know, they've got various admins in there and how are we going to staff for this kid? And um, and this was a, an emerge or a, an inclusion setting. So they were really trying to figure all this out. And a big piece of it was feeding and the SLP that I was helping out, she was just like, I can't, I don't, I can't, what am I going to do with it? I don't know how to do with this. And what a, she was just sort of at a loss. And so, um, in, and of course, in those situations, what often happens, not just with SLPs, but in those complicated kids, sometimes you get in a, in a uh, vigorous game of pass the buck. <laughs> Right. 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 Like this like, end of my job. I'm pretty sure it's your job. Oh no, no, I think it's your job. No. 
I think it's your job. And it's like the blessing and the curse of it being so multidisciplinary, too, because you're like, well, sure, if you as the OT want to take the lead, great. But then I think at some point, me as the speech pathologist really probably has to talk about the oral motor and the uh, pharyngeal swallow and you know like, right right exactly in that there's a little creep there and then also on the same token i can't go it alone if i'm the only one on the team who wants to address this and i don't i can't talk about wheelchair positioning for right, few, you know right, like yeah there's there's limitations to my scope of practice too so you really do have to have everyone invested in a better outcome for that that student right and i think we do have this uh, you know, whether we want to or not. I mean, it's it, it's part of our job. Um, mm-hmm. And so really, I, I think sometimes we get into the schools and we think, well, no, that's why I'm in the school. So I don't have to do that job. <laughs> Which right. I have been totally guilty of saying, like, I'm like, I don't I don't want to do this. But, um, I've you know, I've also been in situations, again, where we get this a move in and they, uh, I mean, once you, I, f- I feel like once you read it in the report, like you're on that's you don't right. have a choice. You really it's in black and white. Right. Yeah. And even if there isn't an established protocol, which is really what you talked about, which is perfect, because I think sometimes we get these kiddos, um, whether or not parents took them in um, or, you know, they're coming out of foster care and they've just been taken in for a new eval or whatever, or you just go digging in the file. Cause I happen to love file reviews. Um, <laughs> cause it's my own little like CSI operation. Right. But, and what, <laughs> it didn't get done. Totally. Yeah, yeah right. totally. Yeah. And I get to be all judgy, but, um, I'm like, Oh, look at this. Look at the, you know, they didn't do this. But, um, when I am, looking at files and you know sometimes you you're the only that speech path is the only one who's doing that and you can see and especially like I was saying you know you can be sort of judgy when you start to look at you know these kiddos who have moved from place to place to place and there's just been no opportunity for follow-through so maybe they had an eval and something got started somewhere and then they moved and and so once you see it there you got to kind of do it right right um so i had a question for you though like sure you do you have any great advice about where you you might even start to identify a team because i have been in that situation where i go oh my gosh like is there somebody in this district I mean, do you do you often mm-hmm. start? Where do you start that conversation? Do you start at the admin level, or where do you start looking to see if there's uh, even anything? <laughs> I yeah. guess this says something about me. I don't think I've ever started that conversation at the admin level. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, a lot of times I'll start it with the people directly serving the child. So I can think of a a child. Um, in a school district that, again, was non-ambulatory. Um, and so I started that conversation with her IEP team, with her direct ser- service sure. providers. Mm-hmm. And the PT, you know, um, was very experienced in some motor things, but not comfortable with feeding and, you know, really said, I can't go there. So then, you know, you find other allies. And then... I think eventually, because the rest of the team was moving forward, she was willing to pass it on to another PT in the district who was comfortable with, you know. mm -hmm. So I don't think you necessarily all have to hold hands 24-7 to, like, push it through. But you can start to, uh, you know, but I think that's why I ended the talk with talking about timelines, too. So maybe your smaller goal is... To really be consistently present at meal times to to address the biggest issues, you know, of like, okay, well, I'm not gonna, it, it, because it puts you in the position sometimes of winning the battle and losing the war if you take right. on too much. So right. you think, okay, the one thing I need to change in the next month is not having this high schooler drink from a bottle oh, with a with a slit in it. Yeah. 
you know and, yes. I, and so that becomes a conversation that you have with the para that feeds him breakfast and then with the para that feeds him lunch and then with the ot because you two are not in the building on the same day but you make a trip back to that building to be there when she's there on a thursday you know what i mean right. like yes it's mm-hmm. it's a numerous small conversations i would say in my experience rather than uh, rarely i think you know especially because not everyone's comfortable with this aspect of our Mm -hmm. profession i think big meetings put people in a more defensive position Mm -hmm. there i find my colleagues are a lot more willing to say oh gosh you have some experience in dysphagia let's you know so i'll pull the ot in but then we'll co-treat because they even if they don't even if they don't consider um feeding their area of expertise they still are the motor specialist on the right. team they still have things yeah. to teach me about this kid or when i'm looking at you know i'm like hey i think we can do something different so his head's not in hyperextension what do you think and they might you know we come to the decision together and i think by doing that then you have a lot greater buy-in yeah i agree and i i mean i've been in that situation too where you, they say oh well, I'm, I'm not sure i'll just hang back and then you know we because they want to help the kid as well. Then they see, once they see something happening, they're like, well, okay, let me just hop in and try this. And so, right. um, let me, let me take this fork. Cause it's really painful yes. for me to see yeah, to watch. Yeah. Pathologist with the fork. <laughs> <Totally>. right? <laughs> yeah. Like, or, uh, or yeah, I'll wonder, I wonder if we could do something. Yeah. So, right. um, and what, I think leaning on other speech pathologists becomes really important too. Like if, if, if you're listening to this talk and you're considering a kid who you think has swallowing problems on your caseload and you're like, I, the last time I thought about this was when I was in grad school, then pull alongside somebody, you know, like sure. it, the person who's working with them in the medical setting is more than willing to help out or, you know, the. I don't think going it alone is a good way to provide a competent service. And I've never known, I think we're in an awesome profession. I've never known a, a speech path to say they won't help. <laughs> you oh, know, fellow, yeah. No, LP, no. You know? Not at all. And I mean, even to the extent where you help out with kids that, I mean, you have no involvement with. You right. know, I've been, I have absolutely leaned on people in the hospital setting or what, you know, I've just done a cold call. Mm-hmm. Like I need help. I right. have no idea. And, um, you know, email and certainly mm-hmm. Twitter and any of those things where you can have these conversations with other clinicians who can really help out. And like you said, generally we're a pretty nice bunch. Right. <laughs> helpful. We're helpful. We're not going to leave anybody out there. No, not <laughs> at all. I was thinking, I was also wondering if you had any good ideas about, if somebody does want to boost up their skill set on this, I'm sort of envisioning somebody who has a new job, you know, has been in the profession for a while, but has a new job in a, you know, self-contained high needs classroom or, um, or um, maybe just, you know, the model in their district change. That is certainly happening a lot where we have right. districts. Um, it seems like that pendulum is swinging back again back towards that full inclusion model right i know of a a couple of districts that are that are moving that way and so all of a sudden you know you're the speech path who's had uh, arctic and language kids for 10 years and now in your building you're going to have some pretty needy kiddos so do you have any great ideas for folks like where a good you reference that um portal on Asha. Oh, which is totally fabulous. But I think really dysphagia is a very um, hands-on experience. And then feeding itself is a it's a high-risk activity mm-hmm. and it's also a personal relation. Um, w- when you're feeding someone else and it's someone else's child, you're stepping into like their most primitive, basic need. That is a parent's responsibility to nourish their child. And so I think 
as you enter that, it's very, it's more practical than some aspects of our profession. So I would say if somebody really, you know, was like, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm being asked to step into this by my administrator, or I'm recognizing that I'm the only one who's going to be serving these kids. I would just shadow people. I would call up your local multidisciplinary feeding clinic, you know, wherever your closest children's hospital is. I have had interactions with in multiple states with the feeding clinics. They've always been totally welcoming for me to come and spend time with them. Um, or look for a bigger district in your area and find their feeding team and hang out with them. Yeah, and see what they're up to. Yeah, the hands-on part because nobody, you know, people let you have their feeding protocol as a template, and they'll, um, you know, kind of learn through that. Doing is probably much more valuable um, for. A speech pathologist in in a field than it is to do kind of the academic theoretical piece because you probably have that you know yeah right right and so what did you say when did you say we start like it started popping up in coursework like 80 the 80s or right right okay well in both the medical profession you know the medical profession didn't even really recognize it as Mm. yeah so it's not it's not been there forever you know our our founders like Jerry Logeman, you know, they, they're right. all, you know, the grand dame of dysphagia. Right. right. Yeah. All, but all these pioneers are, are still within our generation. You know, like sure. it's not like we're, t- we're recalling people long gone or something like this is pioneers within our professional life, you know? Right. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I don't think I really, I mean, I probably knew that, but I don't know if I'd really sort of fully incorporated that thought that, that, yeah, I mean, it just is not that long ago. So anybody who you talk to, I mean, at most they've been doing it for what, 20, 30 years, right. if they were right. on the forefront. So, right. um, so yeah, I think I, that is just such great advice. And I think, I mean, I could really see going into your principal in your building or your sped director or whoever you felt like was going to sign on the dotted line for you. But saying like, hey, I've got all these kiddos and I I really want to be I want to know more about this. And mm-hmm. what do you think? Can I have a sub for the day? Can I right. go oh. up and hang out um, and do this? And um Because, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense to just uh, because, right, like having all the coursework, I don't know, it's very foggy for me. I remember something about turning, (laughs) turning your head to swallow, (laughs) you know, there's some, it's very, it's there. there. Right, right. Well, and even if you did like an adult practicum, there's not a lot of overlap between, you know, yeah. as we know, children are, you know, have you tried to get a three-year-old to follow your aspiration yeah. precautions? That's not how it's going to happen, no. you know? Mm-mm. So it's uh, pediatric dysphagia even is separate than from anything you learned about the adults in, right. in almost every aspect. And that's, you know, and that's why feeding is such a big part of just the swallowing in general with children and you know all the developmental aspects and so yeah it's it, there's a lot going on there that you have to be respectful of and really um seek from others to to help round out as you move forward with a kid well I, yeah i love that idea um okay well i think those are all my pressing questions for you awesome <laughs> so can um <laughs> people email you or email us if they have more questions sure of course we will do that we'll link to that on the um on the website and if you have also if you have any resources maybe um if you could shoot me an email with the portal address and everything we'll make sure that that's linked up in your notes as well and uh yeah maybe i can nail you down in the future to talk about one of the other things you're really good at like oh. Ogcom or something. Oh, 
All right, Wendy, thank you so much. Oh, sure. All right, bye.